Hello and welcome to the Dead on Arrival podcast, presented by the Reverend Dr. Donald E. Dunnigan Sr. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. I want to let you know there is a word from the Lord just for you. My only question to you is, are you ready to receive a word from the Lord? I've been praying for you for this message. I've been praying for me as well. Uh, There are times when I stand to preach and I am uh, anticipating just as much as you are anticipating (laughs) what God is going to do uh, through the message. So it's a joint anticipation of proclaiming and also receiving the word of God. So it, it's, it's, you know, uh, I love what Claire used to say, when there is a little prayer in the pew, there's a little power in the pulpit. But when there is no prayer in the pew, there's no power in the pulpit. But when there is a lot of prayer in the pew, there's a lot of power in the pulpit. So this becomes a joint effort. This is a it's a joint effort. We are doing this together. All right. Are you ready? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is able to give us guidance for our lives. We thank you that it is a lamp for our feet, that through just your spoken word, proclaimed from your written word through the human earthen vessel, that you are able to transform our lives, change our perspective, and guide us into the will that you have ordained for our lives. So we pray that through the preached word today, it will go forth and accomplish the purpose for which you have intended for it to accomplish. We pray and ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Together, God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Latham, for reading from out of the book of Judges. I uh, want to guide you to the book of Judges, the fourth chapter. And in the book of Judges, the fourth chapter is recorded a story about a very little known woman whose name is spelled J-L, J-A-E-L, but it is pronounced Yael. And uh, there's very little known about her, but the only reason that she happens to be in the Bible at all is because Yael was able to figure out a problem that her country had and had been having for 20 years. She was able to figure it out. And so uh, because our AV team is on point, they, uh, they jumped the gun and gave you my title. I was setting it up, but you already know, uh, when in doubt, figure it out. <laughs> and, and so I thought about that title because I was trying to figure out what to preach today to you. And, and I said, well... When in doubt, figure it out. And and so we all don't, I don't have to really talk a whole lot about what doubt is because we all know what doubt is. We all all know that doubt has a way, a wide range of effects on our lives. We know that whenever there is doubt, in our lives, it can paralyze us. If you ever had doubt and you just got stuck in a situation, you you can get paralyzed. Doubt not only can paralyze us, but doubt can be a hindrance for our forward progress. Sometimes when you're in doubt, you don't really know how to move forward. Doubt, if it gets to you too much, can cause some anxiety. Uh, you, You don't know how things are going to turn out, and and then you become a little anxious about it. And if you hold on to it too long, doubt can cause you to become stressful. So, So when in doubt, 
figure it out. But on the other hand, doubt can also serve as a motivating factor. Because when you have some doubt, uh, there are many things that you can do about doubt. You can have doubt and you can stay in doubt. That is an option. You know, you can just hold on to the doubt and let the doubt keep you right where you are. You can have doubt and you can choose to just go out on your own and do it on your own way. That is an option. There are many options when you have doubt. You can pray about it. There are many things that you can do when you have doubt. But but I want to go to this situation that you came in here with today that maybe you have been working through in this particular season in your life. Does anybody have any situations that you're working through in this season in your life? And you're not exactly sure how it's going to turn out. Well, if you came in today, it is not by accident. God has you here so that you can hear a word that can help you out when you are in doubt how to figure it out. And we're going to take a closer look at the folks that's in this passage of Scripture, Judges chapter 4. The first thing you have to do is figure out what the problem is is. Sometimes when you are in doubt, you don't even know what you are in doubt about. You, you know, when you have like, a, you, you can have like a panic attack, you know, and, and when you have a panic attack, that's, a panic attack is a little bit different than an anxiety attack. So anxiety, you know, you know, you upset about something, but when you get a panic attack, you don't even know what you're upset about. You, you just, you just, you just panic and you don't Really, you can't quite figure out what it is that's causing you to panic. But with 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 an anxiety situation, you know what it is. So the first thing you got to do when you are in doubt is figure out what the problem is. You you have to know precisely what it is that you are going. We got to look at what the effects of the situation is that's causing you to want to figure it out. You got to look at maybe what the root cause of it is that's making you want to figure it out. So doubt can at times be a motivating factor in our text. Because God gives us his word, he helps us to arrive at how to figure this out. So here it is. It says in Judges chapter 4, and I want to begin at verse 3, Sisera, Sisera who had 900 iron chariots, ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. Now, we don't have to really do a lot of work to figure out what they're trying to figure out because the text tells us they're trying to figure out how to get out of an oppressive situation. And you know, oppression can have a wide range of effects on people when you are uh, under oppression or not only a person individually, but it can have a tremendous traumatic impact on a group of people or it can be a culture that is undergoing a situation of oppression. When people are oppressed, think about the psychological effects of oppression. One of them is that people who are oppressed, they learn what is called learned helplessness. Think about that. If you are oppressed, you develop something called learned helplessness. That, that is that you don't even feel like you can change your circumstances or improve your situation in life. This is a mindset that is birthed out of oppression. Another effect is is, is a sense of low self-esteem. When you are oppressed, you have a low self-esteem. Some folks have low self-esteem, have no way of knowing why they have low self-esteem. That's because somebody has been oppressing you and you have not even recognized it as oppression because it becomes normalized in your way of living. But if you don't have a high level or an appropriate level of self-esteem, somebody failed to instill in you the value that God said you are. 
God says you are created in my image. Think about that. Now, if I understand what it means to be created in the image of God, God is a creator. That means I have all kind of creative talents and abilities in my life that have been suppressed and oppressed. And I don't even think I fit in. That's the result of oppression. When, when you have been oppressed, you don't think you can do what other folk can do. You don't think that you are worthy of the things that other people have experienced, not only as a person, but also as a group of people. Not only as a group of people, but also as a culture. Listen, oppression, they, they were oppressed they they were oppressed and it had a psychological uh, impact effect on it it had a social impact on them when you are oppressed you get to be marginalized you you understand you you don't even fit in you you can't be a part if you are gay or lesbian i said that yes i said that They get oppressed. They get marginalized. You can't fit in. If you are female or black, there are many places where you just don't fit in strictly based off of your color, based off of your sexual orientation, based off of your religion, based off of your faith. You can be uh, marginalized based off of the color of your skin. I'm not going to get no amens on that. It's simple oppression, and what the text tells us is that they have been oppressed, and they're trying to figure out how to get out from under an oppressive situation. Whenever you are oppressed, you have options. You can just stay there and take it. You can decide to rise up and do something about it. You can pray, but they were identifying specifically what the problem was. It says in verse four here, in verse three here, that this man Sisera, who had 900 iron chariots, ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. He didn't just oppress them, but he ruthlessly oppressed them. That meant that when he ruthlessly oppressed them, he made them work for him and labor for him and they did not get paid. He he made them work in the fields and grow crops so that they could eat, but they did not eat. He and his family ate. He made them work. He made them work for free. He took away their wages. He even took away their women. He took away their children. He damaged their ability to grow. He ruthlessly, ruthlessly oppressed them. Now, if you were in that situation, you'd be trying to figure it out, wouldn't you? That's what they were doing. They were trying to figure it out. And the text says that he did this for how long? 20 years. years. Now, sometimes we can endure stuff for a little while. Maybe five years, okay. You know, 10 years, you, uh, this is not good. 15, but after a while, you're going to say, mm-mm. Enough is enough. And that's why I wanted to intentionally highlight women in the story today to point out that a female judge is over Israel at that time and that she has gained the respect of a military leader. Watch this because of her practice of the habit of the spirit what she had his respect because she practiced the habit of the spirit I know if you're someone saying now wait a minute pastor I know you into this habit of the spirit thing right now but like how did you get the habit out of spirit out of that text Uh, 
I pray, I work, and then y'all make me work harder. So the habit of the spirit, the first thing you got to do is what? All right. Uh, let's see here. Let's see here if we can find some of that. All right. So verse 5. Verse 5. You see it? What did she do? Oh! She was sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. I just want to pause right there because you need to understand how this habit of the spirit works. The first thing in the habit of the spirit you have to do is what? Sit still. This is the next thing you got to do. You got to pray. So what was she doing? When she was sitting under the palm of Deborah, she must have been praying. But here's how I got it. Because I, I was looking at what the author reveals to us in this story. He tells us that she was sitting under the palm of Deborah between Rama and Bethel. Now, Rama and Bethel were important locations in the history of Israel for several reasons. You may recall that Rama is the birthplace of Samuel, who served as the last judge, but the prophet, so he was the first prophet judge of Israel and he became the judge and stayed the judge until there were no more judges. This is where he was born and you find it in 1 Samuel chapter 7 where it reads Samuel continued as Israel's judge for the rest of his life. Each year he traveled around setting up his court first at Bethel then at Gilgal and then Mizpah. He judged the people of Israel at each of these places. Then he would return to his home at Ramah and he would hear cases there too and Samuel built an altar to the Lord at Ramah. It is a spiritual place where people go to commune with God. Rhema, its name means height. So if you want to get above your oppression, you got to go to some high places. And you get there by spending time in the presence of the Lord. But it wasn't just at Rhema. It's uh, between Rhema and Bethel. Now, Bethel is the place where Jacob had a dream. And he had a dream and he sees a salam, which is considered a ladder. As a matter of fact, it says, meanwhile, Jacob left Beersheba and traveled toward Haran. At sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp and stop there for the night. Jacob found a stone to rest his head against and lay down to sleep. As he slept, he dreamt of a stairwell that reached from earth up to heaven. And he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairwell. At the top of the stairwell stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham and the God of your father Isaac. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. I am giving it to you and your descendants and your descendants will be as numerous as the earth. And then he goes on and says, but he said, I was afraid and said, what an awesome place this is. What an awesome place this is. What an awesome place it is. What an awesome place it is. It is none other than the house of God, which is Bethel, the very gateway to heaven. The next morning, Jacob got up very early. He took the stone he had rested his head against and he set it upright as a memorial pillar. Then he poured olive oil over it and he named that place Bethel, which means the house 
of God. Deborah now is sitting <laughs> between Ramah and Bethel. What do you think she is doing? She's praying. And she's meditating. And perhaps she's not reading the word, but she's recalling and recounting what happened when some other folk were between Ramah and Bethel. And she remembers that at this place, God said, I'm going to give you victory. The place where you are sitting is yours. You already have the victory. Now she's sitting there. What is she praying about? She's praying about how to figure out how to get out of this situation of oppression. And while she is praying, guess what happened? Woo! He might not come when you want him. Isn't that what y'all just finished singing? But he's going to come right on time. And so she's praying. And she's asking God, how can you get us out of this situation? And God spoke to Deborah about the qualm she was in under the palm so that she could stay calm. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. And here it is. Listen to verse six. One day she went and sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, who lived in Kadesh in the land of Naphtali, she said to him, I've been praying. I've been practicing the habit of the spirit. And this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Call out 10,000 warriors from the tribe of Naphtali and Zebulun at Mount Tabor, and I will call out Sisera, commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors to the Kishon River. There, 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 I will give you victory over him. But Barak told her, because Barak had also been oppressed, that I don't think I can do this by myself. And therefore, if you've been spending time with God and God has spoken to you, I'll do what you said God told you to do only if you will go with me. Uh. So let me just say this. While you're trying to figure it out, don't ever leave God out. Because with man, some things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And sometimes God may instruct you to do what may not necessarily make sense to you. He might tell you to go dip in a dirty pool to get healed seven times. And you might think in your mind that doesn't make sense because we've got some beautiful blue rivers that I can go dip in. But you want me to dip in the dirty rivers? I don't. That doesn't make sense to me. He might tell you to build an ark and it may take 120 years before any rain drops. It might not make sense. But if God says do it, just go ahead and do it. God may tell you to march around a wall seven times. It may not make a whole lot of sense, but if God says do it, you just do it. So God says, I'm going to give you the victory. Barack says, Barack says, but now, but now, but now, listen, listen. We can't get too upset with Barack. Because he didn't say he wouldn't do it. He just said he wouldn't do it unless you go with me. But, but <clears throat> Here's the problem. So God tells Deborah 
to tell Barak to call out 10,000 warriors from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun. All right, now watch this. Here's the problem. He's got to take 10,000 warriors. But they don't have a good track record. You see the problem here? Like, you want me to take them? And put my life? Watch this. Let, let, let me, let me, I'm going to just help you out. So in Judges chapter 1, Joshua takes over. And in verse 3, verse, chapter 1, verse 3, it says, The men of Judah said to their relatives from the tribe of Simeon, Join with us to fight against the Canaanites living in the territory allotted to us. Then we will help you conquer your territory. So the men of Simeon went with Judah. When the men of Judah attacked, the Lord gave them victory over the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and they killed all of their enemies. Now I'm going to flip you up a little bit further down to verse 17. Then Judah did just what they said. They said, we're going to join you when you go to take your territory. So Judah joined Simeon to fight against the Canaanites living in Zephyr, and they completely destroyed them. Now, if God says to Deborah, go get 10,000 warriors from Judah and Simeon, they have a good track record. But the problem is, in verse 19, the Lord was with the people of Judah and they took possession. Now listen to verse verse 21. Then the tribe of Benjamin, however, fell to drive out the Jebusites. Verse 27. The tribe of Manasseh fell to drive out the people living in Bashan. Verse 29. The tribe of Ephraim fell to drive out the Canaanites living at Gezer. Verse 30. The tribe of Zebulun fell. Fell to drive out the residents from the kitchen. Now you want me to take the tribes that fell to drive out some people to take come against this man with 900 ironclad horses who's been terrorizing us and ruthlessly oppressing us and you want me to believe that God's going to do that? Uh. Now if they had called on the two most decorated, successful tribes, Barak would have said, yeah, I got this. But see, that's the problem. See, when in doubt, you got to figure it out. And when you figure it out, you got to recognize what the problem is. And not only what the problem is, but you've also got to identify what the source of the problem is. The source of the problem is not that Judah and Simeon are great warriors. The source of the problem is that the other tribes failed to exercise faith in God who was able to do what God said he was able to do when he said he was able to do how he said he was able to do it. And God says, I'm going to give you the victory. Not that you're going to earn it, but I'm going to give you the victory. Sometimes we're trying to earn what God has already given to us. God already said you blessed. You don't have to do something to try to earn God's blessing. God already said you are loved. You don't have to try to do something to earn God's love. God already said you've got peace. You don't have to do anything to earn God's peace. God said you already got joy. You don't need to drink for it. You don't need to smoke for it. You don't need to sex for it. You don't need to try to buy it. You don't need to work. God says I've already given this to you and we're trying to work for what God has already promised to us. Oh my. Well, let me uh So So the first thing you got to do is identify what the problem is. Uh The second thing 
you got to explore your options. Yeah. And, and the option that I would recommend to you is the option that Deborah used. Uh -huh. And that option is called the habit of the spirit. So while you're trying to figure it out, you just take some time to sit still. You take some time to pray. And you take some time to inhale the vibrations of God's blessings and peace that he gives to you with each breath that you take. Everything that has breath can praise the Lord. You spend some time in God's word and then you ask God, what is it that you want me to do? Apparently when she asked God, what is it that she, he wants her to do? She said, go tell Barak, you gather the men from the tribes that he thinks is not able to do it and he don't even have enough confidence in himself because he's oppressed and he's got a sense of helplessness as well and he doesn't believe that he has the ability to do what God has promised. Just tell him to do what I told you to tell him to do and if he does that he'll have his issue resolved. Oh man I wish I, I just wish I had a little bit more time. Because I want you to see that sometimes you have to be willing to go where God sends you that doesn't make sense before you can get to the thanksgiving. You see that thanksgiving? The thanksgiving doesn't come after praying. It doesn't come after inhaling. It doesn't come after reading. But it comes after the inquiry. Because you're thanking God for what he's going to do after he has heard you ask him for guidance. Are you following? When God tells you what he's going to do, then you can give thanks. Because watch how Deborah responds to Barack. She says, I don't have any problems whatsoever going. Even though I'm a woman and you are the commander, I don't have any problems going because I believe that what God said he is going to do, God will do it. Verse 9, very well, she replied, I will go with you, but Mr. Commander, sir, the victory is already ours because God said there I will give you victory over him. That's what he said. Some of us are worried because we don't think God is going to do what God said he was going to do. He said, I will give you victory over him. And she believed what God said. Therefore, she had no problems going with Barak. But here's what's going to happen to you, sir. Commander. You will receive no honor in this venture. For the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. Now, now here, here, here it is. I'm, 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 I want to be done. I so want to be done. <laughs> I want to be done. I'm trying to be done, y'all. Let me. 
Ah. So, Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. At Kadesh, Barak called together the tribes of Zebulun and after 10,000 warriors went up with him. Deborah also went with him. Now, Heber the Kenite, a descendant of Moses' brother-in-law, Hobab, had moved away from the other members of his tribe and pitched his tent by the oath of Zananim near Kadesh. When Sisera was told that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, he called for all 900 of his iron chariots and all of his warriors, and they marched from Heba Haresheth Hagoyim to the Kishon River. Then Deborah said to Barak, Get ready. Get ready. This is the day the Lord will give you victory over Sisera for the Lord is marching ahead of you so Barak led his 10,000 warriors down the slopes of Mount Tabor into battle when Barak attacked the Lord through Sisera and all his chariots and warriors into a panic they had a panic attack oh, oh, oh. we don't even know what we're panicking about they just had a panic attack these were warriors they had a panic attack Sisera leaped down from his chariot and escaped on foot. Then Barak chased the chariots and the enemy army all the way to Heresheth Hagoyim, killing all of Sisera's warriors. Not a single one was left alive. Meanwhile, Sisera ran to the tent of Yael. That's why I was, I think we started off with her, didn't we? Yeah, we did start with Yael. I was supposed to be telling about Yael. So uh, we went to the tent, and, and, and the wife of Heber, the Kenite, because Heber's family was on friendly terms with the king of Jabin of Hazor. Jael, Yael, went out to meet Sisera and said to him, come into my tent, sir. Come in. Don't be afraid. So he went into her tent and she covered him with the blanket. Oh, you've been running. You tired. You look like you're thirsty. Yeah, I am. I am. I'm. I'm. I'm uh, uh. Here, here, here. No, 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 sit down. Just lay down. Just lay down right here. Let me give you some water. No, 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 no. I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you some milk. From the leather bag. He said, well, stand at the door. And if anybody comes to ask you if, if anybody here, just say no. But when Sarah fell, uh, Sisera fell asleep from exhaustion, Yael quietly crept up on him Shh, with a hammer and a tin pan. Boom! And she drove the tin pan through his temple and into the ground, and he died. Now that's a hard text to grapple with. And don't think about it too much because you know you get the visual in your head. That, that's rough. Let me just say that for the most part, God doesn't rely upon violence to resolve oppression. But when in doubt, you got to figure it out. This has been 20 years of ruthless oppression. 
And they that live by the sword will die by the sword. Now, she gave him some milk and some yogurt. She gave him his last meal. Yeah. But 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 here here here's what I want to get to. Is that Deborah told Barak that the victory would be at the hands of a woman. But she didn't say which woman. She didn't say it was her. So when you are practicing the habit of the spirit, God will put you in the right place at the right time to affect God's will for his glory. She just happened to be in the right place at the right time to get the victory for Israel. But you got to see, Deborah, after she sat still, after she prayed, after she inhaled, after she recalled the word of God, after she inquired and trust and believed, she was able to then go into a song of praise. And listen to what she says. Oh my, in chapter 5, she goes in deep. She goes in so deep. She says that God has fought this battle for us. There were few people left in the villages of Israel until Deborah arose as a mother for Israel. When Israel chose new gods, war erupted at the city gates, yet not a shield or spear could be seen among 40,000 warriors. And Israel considered this, you ride on fine donkeys, you who sat on fancy saddles and blankets, listen to the village musicians gathered at the watering holes. They recount the righteous victories of the Lord. Then wake up, Deborah, wake up, Deborah, wake up, wake up and sing a song. Arise, Barak, lead your captives away, son of Abinoam. Down from Tabor and march the few against the nobles. The people of the Lord marched down against mighty warriors. They came down from Ephraim, a land that once belonged to the Amalekites. They followed you, Benjamin, with your troops. And she goes on. She goes on down. And then she says, most blessed among women is Yael. The wife of Heber the Kenite. Now, you know, the Kenites were some bad folk. She was she was a bad sister. Uh, the, 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 the Kenites, that's the fellow who helped Moses out when he was in trouble. You, you remember Jethro? Yeah. He was a Kenite, yeah. Yeah, Jethro was a Kenite. So she's she's from that tribe, that 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 royal tribe. She's from that place. They got a lot of smarts about them. They got a lot of wits about them. He says, may she be blessed above all women who live in tents. She knew exactly what to do, how to get him at ease, how to put him down and then take him out. She knew exactly. Sisera asked for water and she gave him milk in a bowl fit for noble. She brought him yogurt. Then with her left hand, she reached for her tent peg and with her right hand the, for the workman's hammer. She struck Cicero with the hammer, crushing his head with shattering blow. She pierced his temples. He sank. He fell. He lay still at her feet and where he sank there and died from the window. Listen, Sarah's mother looked out through the window she watched for his return saying why is his chariot so long and coming why don't we hear the sound of chariot wheels her wise women answered and she repeats these words to herself they must be dividing the captive the captive plunder with a woman or two for every man there will be colorful robes for sarah and colorful embroidery robes for him for me yes the plunder will include colorful robes and broad on both sides lord may all your enemies die like Sisera but may those who love you rise like the sun in all its power the mother was complicit in all of the evil deeds that Sisera was doing and therefore Deborah was singing that now the mother gets to experience what tens of thousands of mothers in Israel have experienced because she put forth a child who was bringing wrecking havoc on this nation who brutally oppressed us who, uh, who took a 
advantage of the women, who took advantage of the men, who took advantage of the children, who made them labor and work and refused to give them an education, who did not pay adequate wages so that they could have a decent living. And now the mother gets to experience all of that because God reheard us and he remembered our suffering. When, when, when you are in doubt, all I, I, I said, all I have to say this. First of all, you got to identify what the issue is. Because if you don't identify the issue, you'll never get to the root of the problem. It'll just keep on happening. You understand? We have mass murders taking place in this country. Pretty much every week, there's another one. The root of the problem is inadequate gun control. It's pretty simple. The root of the problem is that we do not have enough support and help for people with mental illness. That's the problem. If you came in here and you have diabetes and you fall out, we can't blame you for not knowing that you've got diabetes. We got to help you to understand that you've got diabetes and this is what you have to do to maintain your diabetes. We got to help you to understand that this is what you have. You have high blood pressure. You have headaches all the time. Get your blood pressure checked because you just may have high blood pressure. If you have high blood pressure, we can send you to a doctor. The doctor can examine you, determine that you have high blood pressure, put a cuff on you, take a look at your blood pressure, say, yes, you got high blood pressure. This is the medication that you need. If you have mental illness, You pretty much on your own. We need more help for people who have mental illness. It's a part of your body, like your liver and your heart and your lungs and your mind. It's not your fault that you have mental illness, we got to help you get the help you need to correct and adjust what is necessary for your mental health. It's simple. And yet, we have a Congress that refuses to identify the root of the problem. Perhaps the spirit of Sisera is still alive. Maybe there is something going on intentionally designed to keep people oppressed. Oh, I can tell you, I can tell you the number of stories I have had to help people with mental illness try to get help after it was too late for them to get the help that they needed and they ended up incarcerated because they did something that could have been avoided if they had the support that they needed before they went all the way off and snapped. And how many mothers are crying out, help me, my child needs help. You don't expect me to fix their diabetic issue. You don't expect me to deal with their lung issue. Why am I as a parent responsible to take care of my child's mental illness? I just want help. And you know what they tell them? We can't help you unless they do some harm to someone else and then we can help you yes. see I, 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 I'm a firm believer that when in doubt you got to figure it out yeah. identify the root of the problem yes. and then once you identify the root of the problem determine what the options are 
And trust me when I tell you that you always have options. That's what the habit of the Spirit will teach you. That you always have. I don't ever let somebody tell you you don't have a choice. You always, you always have options. You go through the habit of the Spirit. May not come when you want it. And as we see in this story, it might not even be the answer you're looking for. Go get a couple of losers. And I'm going to give you the victory. I ain't doing that. I want you to let something go. I want you to release it. I, I, I want you to trust me. But, but, but God, I, I can't do that. See, see we got to be able to recognize our own doubt. Remember the man who wanted his son healed? And he took him to Jesus? Jesus said, you think I can do this? He says, well, you know, you could if you wanted to. He said, what do you mean if, if I wanted to? He said, do you believe? He said, I do have some belief. But, but I, I got this doubt. And I need you to help me with my doubt. See, sometimes doubt can be a motivator for us to fall on our knees and pray just a little harder. How many of you got some issues? And you pray, but now God is saying you need to go between Rama and Bethel. You need to get into some serious spiritual warfare and watch me work it out when in doubt <laughs> work it out and then trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. May God bless you. I pray this word blesses you, strengthens you, lifts you, and encourages you. Thank you for joining us. See you next week. We upload our podcast every Sunday at 7 p.m. Thanks again, and have a great day.